praise the lord my name is olu shegun moku olu and i'm sharing about what it means for jesus to become poor you know the scripture says in second corinthians chapter 8 that christ became poor that we might become rich and people have all kind of interpretation for this what exactly does it mean and i'm doing this video because we have been so much indoctrinated about poverty prosperity that we have a wrong mindset about what exactly constitutes poverty and what exactly constitute prosperity and the plan of god for our lives in fact <clears throat> by the time most people see any post that says that a christian can be poor they are up in arms is because they have been so wrongly indoctrinated they have been taught wrong things and we're going to look at what jesus said uh, what the scripture says about jesus becoming poor <clears throat> you know recently i shared a post that says that if anyone says a christian cannot be poor that message is from the pit of hell and somebody was saying substantiate it with the scripture where did the bible say that <laughs> in the book of revelation chapter 2 jesus writing to the church in smyrna he said to them, I know your poverty, but thou art rich. You know, this thing is so amazing how Satan succeeds in blinding people. Black and white, everybody can pick their Bible right away as I'm speaking and open to Revelation chapter 2. He says, I know your poverty, but you are rich. Now, that tells you a few things materially speaking that church was poor but jesus was trying to change the way they think about poverty that see poverty is not lack of money that you can't pay your bills is not poverty to me to jesus he says you are rich because you are in christ you are not rich because you have naira because you have dollars because you have pounds because you have euros that is not what makes you rich you are rich because you are in christ jesus even said it that again in another place he said if you have been unfaithful with unrighteous mammon that is money he said who will give you true riches even with that jesus has made it clear that true riches is not money again in that same book of revelation chapter 3 jesus was speaking to a church in laodicea he said see you believe you have everything you believe you don't need me you believe you are rich but you don't know that you are poor you are wretched so you see christ was simply saying clearly to us that riches a rich person it's not somebody that has money a rich person is somebody that has christ so for the church that felt that they have enough wealth material and do you know it is so today check most of the places where they boast about their riches they are basically a dead church is it not a dead church when fornicators can come every sunday and sit down and go back nothing pricks their heart is it not a dead church when you bring uncircumcised comedians to the pulpit to come and entertain the people of god do you think that is not a dead church is it not a dead church when the man in charge can get up and cause people and and rain abuses nothing happens you don't you don't know that is a dead church it is a dead church what they have going is psychology and the blindness of the people that are following them so jesus made it very clear but you know people will never read the bible 
they will just be quoting something somebody quoted from the Bible and they will be quoting it. They wouldn't say, let me even go and check that chapter of the Bible. What exactly does it say? Because what we are going to do today is to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the entire chapter. That's how to learn, except you don't want to learn. You know, and I've seen people, they will tell me and say, sir, just tell me yes or no. And I'm like, please go and watch this message. They say, no, they don't want to watch any message. Tell me yes or no. You know, they are not ready to learn. Is that how to learn the word of God? Is that how you learn in your school? Did you go to your teacher in school and say, my teacher, please just tell me, just tell me uh, everything in, in one word, yes or no? Is that how you learn? Is that how you pass your exams? But when it comes to the things of God, you don't have the discipline to sit down to learn. You cannot invest in getting materials that are going to profit your soul. You don't want anybody to open the Bible and say, let's look at the Bible systematically. No, you don't want that. You just want somebody to give you answer. My brother and sister, it is not done like that. If only you pick your Bible, you will see what we are saying. Now, you know, at times I'm amazed that when people say, how can you say uh, prosperity is all over the Bible? I look at them and I ask myself, when they look at me, do I look like somebody who is begging to eat? Do I look like somebody who also want to, who want to suffer in life? We are simply sharing the truth of the scripture. You can be a Christian, you can be born again and be poor. <laughs> the fact is, most of you are poor. Whether you acknowledge it or you don't acknowledge it. Let me share a few things with you. This, the Bible is very interesting. Did you remember that David said, have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor you see beg for bread. Did you remember that David said that? Now I want to ask you, on two occasions, David begged for bread. One, he went to, he sent his boys to neighbor, the husband of Abigail, to go and beg for bread. In fact, when they didn't give David, he was going to kill him. The second time, he went to the temple, to the priest. There was no bread. He was looking for food. And they had to give David the bread from the temple. Yet, David said, have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor he see beg for bread. But David himself begged for bread twice. Now, that scripture, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Is it true? Yes, it is true. It's not contradictory. It is because we have refused to learn what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Let me tell you the other part. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Isn't it? Good. What happened to Jesus? What does it mean to be forsaken? On the cross, the most, the only righteous man, really, Jesus, he said, Father, Father, why have you what? Forsaken me. Forsaken me. Yet the scripture says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. So what happened? Why was Jesus forsaken? And so that will tell you something. What does it mean to be forsaken? When John was beheaded, was he forsaken? When James was beheaded, was he forsaken? So if they were not forsaken and those things happened to them, so could it be possible that you, you cannot pay your bills? Does that mean you are forsaken? You know, see, it is easy for somebody who wants to deceive you to deceive you. Because every human being is born to love money. Except you are born again and the Holy Spirit walk upon your life, you will always love money. That's why Jesus said, <laughs> you cannot serve God and money. He didn't say you cannot serve God and Satan. He said you can't serve God and money. He was almost equating God and money. Because money will, will demand from your life the same commitment that God demands from your life. Do you know I've seen people that when they began all this networking business, long reach and so on, I, as in people that I know that they were sharing the gospel, they were sharing posts about Jesus, all of a sudden they couldn't do it again. Check their status now. All is long reach. <laughs> it's not coincidental. It's not, it's not accidental rather. Something has to bow. If you don't know how to live the new creation life, there's no way money will demand for all your attention. 
So you will see the same people that are saying, Oh, we must make Jesus known. We must make Jesus known. We must preach only Jesus. Go and check their status. It is all the things that they are selling that are always there. Jesus is not there. The gospel is not there. So you got to be very careful. So it's very easy for somebody to deceive you because the average human being loves money. The average human being is greedy for money. So it makes it very easy for anybody to come around and deceive you. Once, you, once somebody tells you that, oh, you know, the Bible says Jesus became poor that we might become rich. You know, your ears opened. Ah, yes, yes. Somebody will tell you, I have grace. I, <laughs> I was hearing somebody saying, I have the grace to give people speed, speed, speed. And he now said, receive that grace, receive that grace. Some people were even crying. Oh, oh. Do you know why they were crying? The love of money. <laughs> you know what they were thinking? How all their businesses, all their plans, all the money they will be expecting will come in quickly. Since the man of God says he has the grace for speed. Can you imagine? The grace upon his own life is for speed. He is not for righteous living. He does not have grace to make people to become like Jesus. He does not have grace to make people to know Jesus. The grace he carries is his speed, speed, speed. Where did you see that in the Bible? <laughs> the Bible says God makes all things beautiful in his own time. Do you want to hurry God? Do you want to hurry God? You are the only one that can slow God down in your life. You don't need any grace for speed. You are the only person that can slow God down in your life. All those things is, a, is lie. It, it's just deception. So you will go to that meeting. You will feel that something has happened. Nothing has happened. That man will collect his honorarium. Now in millions. And he will continue to get richer. And they will be inviting him everywhere. He keeps collecting. That's how they do. They will be collecting on radio everywhere. Keep getting richer. And they will be telling you that they carry grace. If you want to touch that grace upon the servant of God. You know, they now create all this mystery. <laughs> Around servant of God. We are all servant of God. I'm a servant of God myself. There is no, there is no mystery to all these things. What we are called to do is to make Jesus know. You are called to preach Jesus. All this one that you are deceiving the people. You know, I had a man, he was a preacher, he was saying that the reason a rich man will hold your hand and yet he will not bless you is because of what you carry on the inside. And yet when he sees another man, he blesses that man. So it is a rich man now that is blessing people. That is the love of money. On the pulpit and on the pews. It is the love of money. That message is a demonic message. It is a message from the kingdom of darkness. You see, anything that is in opposition to the teaching of Christ, where does it come from? He says, those who are not for me are against me. There is no middle way in the things of God. You are either in the light or you are in the dark. You are either for Jesus or you are either for Satan. There is no middle way. Let me tell you, if you are not for Jesus, you are for Satan. If you are not living for Jesus, you are living for Satan. There is no middle way in spiritual things. You are simply for Satan. So all those kind of men, they feel that were puppets to date. And that's what you want to hear. Because of your poverty. Because of your love for money. That's what you want to hear. You want to hear anybody that comes and, and lie to you. Since they've been lying like that, what has happened to your life? It's because people will not think. They come and go. They tell you they carry grace to release this into your life. Since they've been releasing it, what has happened to your life? And we, that we are not receiving that their grace, are we coming to you to beg? Are we coming to you to beg? <laughs> you know, many people are not ready to suffer. Philippians 1.29 for, for it is given unto you not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ but to also suffer for his sake. It says in, a, in another place it says if ye suffer with him then shall ye be glorified with him. They that will live righteous must suffer persecution. Brethren, you cannot follow Jesus and not suffer. 
The Bible says, Jesus himself said, he that if you want to follow me, let him deny himself. If any man will follow me, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Pick up his cross and follow me. You cannot follow Jesus without suffering. That is the gospel truth. All this one they are doing, they are just trying to put you in perpetual bondage so that God will not do what he intends to do in your life. So let's look at that passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to begin from verse 1. So if you have your Bible and you're interested, you can open to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. That's how to, to, to authenticate whether something is true or not. That's how to do it. So let's look at it. So Paul writing said, and now brothers and sisters, we want you to know, I'm reading from uh, NIV version. We want you to know about the grace that, has, that God has given the Macedonia churches. Now look at this. I want you to know the grace that God has given the Macedonia churches. What is that grace? Verse 2. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. <laughs> have, have you ever read that before in your Bible? That's a church. Look at how the Bible describes them. Their extreme poverty. I know many of you have never seen this in your own Bible. This is in the same chapter that they caught to you that Jesus became poor so that you can be rich. And the, the church that the Holy Spirit was speaking about here, the Bible says in their extreme poverty, that's not an ordinary poverty. And church Paul knew they were in extreme poverty. He didn't say, it is because you are not tithing. It is because you are not sending seed. Even the church in Revelation chapter 2, that Jesus said, I know your poverty. He, do you know he didn't solve their poverty problem? He just told them, he said, you are rich. Lack is not poverty. He said, you are rich. Guess what he said? He promised them more suffering. He said, many of you will be thrown into the prison and you will be tried by the devil. He said, be faithful unto death. Your faithfulness is more important to God than your comfort. They don't teach you this thing. They don't preach it. And because you do not read your Bible, you are easy to be deceived. A generation that does not read the Bible, they have become a prey in the hand of men who also are seeking something for their own stomach. They will deceive you till you die. They will continue to deceive you. Except you yourself, you lay hold of the word of God. They will just bring a Bible. You know, you know the devil, what he did to, to Jesus? He just brought in one verse of the Bible. Quoted, quoted it out of context. And presented it to Jesus. But thank God for the master, the word himself. <laughs> Jesus showed him that, see, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why must I jump? Even if that scripture is written for me, why must I go and jump to, to go and check whether what God said is true or not? The word of God is true. We don't need to test it. But many of us today are deceived. Let me say this to you. Go and check. All these churches that are deceiving people everywhere, they never do systematic teaching. They don't read the Bible as I'm reading like this. Many of them. Many, many. They, if they do it, maybe once in a while, and they are just going to read a long passage like this that suits what they want to say. They do not make it a systematic practice to teach the scripture like this which is what any pastor teacher apostle should be doing why do you think god gave us this bible and then you are a minister of god now let's go further he said in verse 2 in the midst of a very severe of severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity can you imagine paul was saying that though they had extreme poverty he was surprised that they were still a giver. That's the grace he was talking about. Hallelujah. Do you get the grace? He says the, the grace the, he is talking about in verse 1 is the grace to give out of extreme poverty. That's the grace that the church in Macedonia, that's the grace they had. Then he said, verse 3, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able. And even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It says, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the lost people. And they exceeded our expectations. See, so he's talking about the church in Macedonia. How they gave out of their power. Now, they couldn't believe they could give this way. Then he said, they gave themselves first, first of all to the Lord. That's another matter. They didn't just give. Today, men of God are ready to accept money from thieves. God does not accept money from sinners. But many of his servants today, they are ready. If you go and do prostitution and you bring money, they are ready to collect it. He said this church, they gave themselves first to the Lord. God is not looking first of all for your resources. Do you know why they were able to give out of poverty? Because they are giving themselves to the Lord. Because if, if, you are, if God owns you, who then owns what you have? But there are people today, they are doing giving, thinking they could bribe God. You are living in sin. You are living in unrighteousness. You are fornicating. You are lying. You are into adultery. But your tithe is intact. You are deceiving yourself. Who even ask you to tithe in the first place? You are deceiving yourself. You are sowing useless seeds. Some of you have malice, hatred, unforgiving heart, bitterness towards people. And then you say, you're, you are giving your, your, your pastor seed. I don't, those kind of seeds, they are poisons. They are poison. So they gave themselves first to the Lord. Have you given yourself to the Lord? You know, that's what he said in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you give your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. When you give yourself to the Lord, nobody needs to preach to you to give. As a pastor, and if you have labored on the life of the people to give themselves to the Lord, you don't need to preach about giving. You don't, in my church, nobody preaches about uh, giving, giving. If we want to take offering, you won't even know. Nobody will come up and begin to psych people and say, brethren, if you give, you'll be giving. If you... that's, that's emergency. We don't do that. You won't even know that we are taking off. In five minutes, we are done with it. Nobody says anything about it. There is no special prayer. There is no... It's done and it's gone. It's gone. No noise about it because offering is not what we came to do. We came to fellowship. We came to hear the word of God. So the Bible says, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. This act of grace. Look at what he's calling the act of grace. It's not grace that gives riches. It is grace that makes the church to give out of extreme poverty. <laughs> it says in verse 7, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So hear what Paul is now saying to the church in Corinthians. He was using the church in Macedonia, as an example to the church in Corinthians. That, oh, with all your big, big, big gifts. You know, the church in Corinthians was so gifted. With all your gifts, he said, you must excel in this grace also. So giving has nothing to do with how much you have. The quality of your giving is not determined by the quantity of your giving. It is determined by the purity of your heart towards God. By your love for Jesus, by your love for the kingdom of God, that's what determines the quality of your giving. It's not how much you give. Blind men on our pulpit today, they will be calling people out. You know, some things are disgusting. They are shameful. They will be calling men out based on how much they give. 100,000 above, then he will now offer them special prayer. God does not hear that prayer. If you are coming out for such, everything that man prayed for does not go beyond the sleep. They will never 
never ascend beyond his own mouth. Never. Not to talk of ascending to the throne of grace. All such things. Those are not the church of God. Those are thieves. Armed robbers, dens of robbers on the pulpit that you are calling men out. So the, the widow that gives her widow's mind, if it was in many of these fake churches, nobody will reckon with her. <laughs> Heaven has surprises. Yet Jesus said, she gave the most. Our pastors, those wicked pastors today, they will have been calling all the people that gave huge amount of money. Because for us, it is the quantity that matters, not the heart before God. But God is not food, brethren. So he was saying to the Corinthian church, emulate the Macedonian church. He wasn't saying to them that, oh, I'm going to give, my, I have anointing to prosper you. Did you see that? He was telling them that the, the Macedonian church, out of their poverty, not just poverty, extreme poverty. Please pick your Bible and read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In verse 8, he now said, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Can you imagine? Hallelujah. There's so many things here. I'm so excited. You see, he was using other church to talk to them. That see what the Macedonians are doing. See what you are doing. Now, he now said, he now said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Now, understand, you know he talked about the grace of the Macedonian church. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, the first thing Paul was saying is this. He was telling them, this passage is actually a passage to say to them, to do what Jesus did. You don't get it. He's saying to you, that you are to make yourself poor for others to be rich. The same way the church in Macedonia they made, they gave out of their own extreme poverty. So what God is saying to you and I is that we should not wait until we have riches before we bless others, before we help others. That's what he's saying. Because let me say to you, if he says Jesus was rich and he became poor, rich in what? Did you see Naira in heaven? Did you see dollars in heaven? Did you see euros or pounds in heaven? Will Jesus come and give his precious life for paper that you human being printed? You don't get this. We go to the bush and cut trees that God created. We take it to a paper mill. We process it. And we print it. And then we write any figure we like on it. You can write 1,000. You can write 100. You can write 500. And then we say, this is money. And then Jesus, the king of glory, the author and the finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end, the creator of all things, the God of all flesh, the possessor of the heaven and the earth, the alpha and the omega, the Lord God almighty will now come and die for what unbelievers printed in paper mill, in printing mill. Do you think that's what Jesus died for? You don't go about, I cannot be poor. He was a poor. He said, I can be rich. He is saying, you, 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 make other people rich, even out of your extreme poverty. That is the message to the church. The riches of Christ is not, a, it's not riches of money. Jesus didn't need to die for anybody to have money. Did you know that most of the top richest people in the world, they don't even have Christ? Elon Musk, I just had just became the richest man. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and so on. They don't know Jesus. They don't know God. Even in Africa here, Dangote, he's not born again. So if you say Jesus became poor so that you can be rich, poor in what? If you say Dangote became poor, that means he gave his money so that I can be rich. But if they say Jesus became poor, he is using it as an analogy. 
that Jesus came to suffer. Even though he could sit in glory, he chose to come and walk in dirty Jerusalem. He chose to come and dwell among men. He chose to come and be insulted. He chose to be slapped. He chose to be spit upon. To be killed like a common thief. So that you can become saved. But when people read, when, when people without the mind of Christ read that passage, they think Jesus became poor so that they can have dollars. So that they can have naira. They can have money to spend. All your men mentality is money. May God deliver you from the God of mammon that has taken over your heart, your mind, and your thinking. May the Lord deliver you. So anytime you hear any message that says a Christian can be poor, you are on the defense. Yes, you are on the defense because the love of money is planted in your soul. Because Satan has put the God of mammon upon the throne on your heart. Who told you that he will not provide? He says, seek ye first. The kingdom of God. Is your life about the kingdom of God? Take it from your social media. Your, even your social media is not about the kingdom of God. Your words that comes out of your mouth is not about the kingdom of God. When you have gone into an hotel to go and sleep and fornicate, you will not come and say, he, he became poor, so that I can be rich. Like all this takeover generation. They say we are takeover generation. Takeover generation, they can only wear suit. They cannot overcome lying. They cannot overcome sin. The, what they take over? Well, yeah, we are takeover generation. What are you taking over? Is that, to take, is that how to take over? How did Paul took over his own generation? Was it by wearing suit? By selling, I celebrate you? Don't celebrate me. No human being is worthy to be celebrated but Jesus Christ. I don't want to be celebrated. Celebrate only Jesus. Say it to Jesus. Don't say it to me. Some people will say, no, sir, it's, it's the Jesus in you we are celebrating. The Jesus in me, you can celebrate him without telling me you celebrate me. So go and tell him. You can tell that Jesus in your room. Jesus has celebrate you. You don't need to come and tell me and say, Sir, I celebrate you. And then you are now saying you are celebrating Jesus in me. I don't want to be celebrated. I'm not worthy of being celebrated. Only Jesus is worthy. When they praised Paul and they said, This, this are God. Do you know what Paul did? He tore his clothes. He tore his clothes like this. And put ashes up on himself, and he said, Men and brethren, we are men like you. Those men, they will never allow anybody to praise them, they will never allow anybody to make them look like they are like equate them to God. But right, right, right in our day, a pastor said he wished he can worship Oyakilome, he said he is worshipable. The church didn't cry. May God have mercy on the church in Nigeria. You see that statement alone. We should be all up and cry to God for mercy. Even the man involved, I didn't see him prostrating. I said, no, brethren, I'm a human being. I'm not worshipable. How can you? <laughs> Jesus, how can a human being be equated to God that is worshipable? Something is wrong with us. Something is wrong with us. Those pastors, they are courtists. You can't be a true child of God. I heard the other day somebody was saying to T.B. Joshua, I said, you are God in the flesh. Do you know T.B. Joshua didn't say anything? These are not men of God. You think any true servant of God want to be praised? You think any true servant of God want to be commended? No, 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 no. Only Jesus deserves the glory. None of us is worthy. Who are you? When did you come into this world? When were you born? When? Adam lived 900 years. Did you know many people have lived 900 years right on this earth? You are just you are just 55 years old. Somebody is telling you that you are God. Can you imagine that insult? And the church will not rise. 
What is it that we are to fight? But if somebody says, oh, the church must pay tax, we are up in arms. We are like, this is the devil's work. We will, be, we will not start cursing people on the pulpit. We will not start cursing people. Why? Because we are serving money. We are not serving God. Let me tell you the story of two heralds. The first herald, he said, go and kill every child two years below. Can you imagine as a mother? Your child is celebrating one year birthday. You are snapping pictures. And then soldiers will come and take that child right in front of you and slaughter that child and put that dead body down. Herod commanded that because he wanted to kill Jesus. Did you know God didn't do anything to that Herod? The second Herod, he was just giving a speech. And men said to him, these are God's. The voice is like the voice of God. The Bible said because he did not give glory to God. He began to rot in on the spot. God judged him. God was saying to us, don't touch my glory. You and I, we think that first Herod was the most wicked person that God should judge him immediately. Do you know God didn't do anything to that one? The second Herod that took the glory of God, he, he, he became rotten. Brethren, never play with the glory of God. Be careful all of these things that we say to one another. People we want to introduce you, they say, please, with a clap offering, a standing ovation for a man of God, a powerful man of God. Nonsense. Nonsense. Why are you giving anybody standing ovation? I don't need anybody standing ovation. I don't need any clapping. And if that clapping is for Jesus, I don't need to be there. You can always clap for Jesus anywhere. You don't need me. No man is powerful. There is no man of God, powerful man of God anywhere. Go and read your Bible. Show me where there is a powerful man of God. There's no powerful man of God. We only have the Lord God Almighty. He is the only one that is powerful. Be careful, brethren. Pick your Bible and read. In this day, in this day and age, people will be deceived. And many, many are already in deception. See, some people will see this topic. They will not watch the video. And they will start commenting and say, Jesus became poor that we might have money. That's the generation we have raised. A generation that cannot click on the link of a video to watch the content. But we start arguing. Do you, can you believe that? I've seen people arguing with ordinary title. Ordinary title. They just see title. Because they don't have the diligence to click, to watch. They're already arguing. For what they don't know. May God have mercy on you. So when you look at that passage. When you look at it. It's because they have not taken time. To go through that passage for you. And you have not picked your Bible. I just read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 1 to 8. Go and read it yourself. You will see what he's saying. See, we don't need to pray for provision as such. We don't need to stress ourselves. Let me be honest with you. If you sincerely walk in Christ, all that you need for life and godliness has been provided. Anything you don't have is excess. And I want to say to you, you will suffer. God will take you through a period of suffering. Whether you like it or not, you will go through period of suffering. Let me tell you a story, a personal story. I've shared this before in one of our videos, but let me say it to you again. I read um, Watchman Nee's book, how he chose that he will start depending on God for his provision. And I was so touched by that book. And I said that I also, henceforth, I was going to be trusting God for my provision. I was in my final year in the university. So I have one more section to go. One more school fees to pay. I refuse to tell anybody in the house that I need school fees, school fees to be paid. And nobody remembered to pay my school fees. So I said, God, if Watchmani can trust you, I will also learn to trust you. That you are my father, you will provide for me. I kept on waiting. One day, one of my friends told me, he said, they are now taking late school fees, so, and you have not paid. I said, don't worry, I will pay. 
when I go back in my room, <laughs> I will be afraid. I will be saying to myself, am I not stupid? What kind of faith am I practicing? But somehow I felt this is the right thing. I want to learn to trust God. So I kept on. And then finally they told me that there is no more payment for school fees. Which means that I have lost a whole one year in the university. For, for, because I read the book and I said I want to trust God. Then, a few days later, a lady came and she said, I'm coming from Enugu. I branched Delta to see your brother. And um, he gave me this nylon to give to you. So I took it. And I checked. This story was in 2000, 2002. This, was, this should be 2002. So I opened it. And I saw a, a Dick's player and an envelope. I opened the envelope. I saw money. I counted it. It was sufficient to pay my school fees, and there were some left. But they said the school fees had closed. So I went to the bursary. In those days, we don't pay online. So I went to the bursary to pay. I gave them the normal school fees without the late payment. They accepted it. They issued me receipt. No problem. I was like, wow, God, you are awesome. From henceforth, I will begin to trust you for my provision. When my brother returned from Delta, because we live in Quara. You see, I'm quoting town names, date, so that you can see how true this story is. They are verifiable. When my brother came back, I told him the story. He was shocked. I said, why are you shocked? He now told me his own side of the story. You see, this lady that came from Enugu went to a local government they call Ole Local Government. I'm not sure if I pronounce it well, but it's something like that. Ole Local Government in Delta State. Now, that was where my brother was serving. But my brother had left that place to go to Abuja. So he needed to go to the capital of Delta State before he can take a bus to Abuja. Now, when this sister came from Enugu, he didn't meet my brother. They said he had gone to Abuja. So instead of her to walk away, she just stood there. She didn't know what to do. My brother, who was already in the state capital, remembered that he did not switch off the fan in his room and decided to return. It was when he returned, he now met this lady. I said, oh, please, ah, help me give Shegun this. Tell him that I'm coming soon. That was how my school fees was paid. Brethren, I don't need any man of God to begin to tell me, oh, hey, if I lay hands here, yeah, you will begin to have abundance. You begin to have provision. For what? Now, I made that story. I just shortened it. A complete version is available online. I titled it, Lord, I Need Money. Now, a lady requested for that video. So I sent her the link. She watched it. When she watched it, she now said, Sir, I tap into your grace. I said, No. You can never tap into my grace that way. When me, I read Watch Money, I said I was going to trust God. You now, you've read me. You, you now say you tap into my grace. It doesn't work like that. You also, you should be inspired to say, I want to trust God. You should be inspired to say, I want to learn how God provides for his own children. If I didn't go through that way, I won't learn it. So today, I'm learning to depend on God and to require him. There are many things I want to do. I don't have money to do. But I know that anything that God really wants us to do, he will make provision. There are times we lack things in the house. And there are times we have. That's why Paul said, I've learned in all things how to abase and how to abound. So he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. My dear brothers and sisters, what you need is a walk with God. It's not a man of God to declare prosperity over your life. That is falsehood. Did you know what Paul said? He said, let him that steals, steals no more, but let him walk with his hand. He didn't say, let him that steals, steals no more. Let him sow a seed. He didn't say, let him come and listen to prosperity message. He said, let him walk with his hands. God, we are God's children. He has bought us with a price. Will he not provide for you? O oh, ye of little faith, will he not provide for you? And then you are quoting scripture wrongly. You are quoting scripture wrongly. Here and there. Oh, Abraham became rich. Abraham, eh, eh, Jacob was rich. 
Abraham trusted God for one child for 25 years. Some of you, because you are not married at the age of 40, at the age of 30, you are already thinking of quitting on God because you are not married. Abraham, for 25 years, he was trusting God. Abraham had famine in the land such that he ran to Egypt. A man running out of the will of God for his life. You think that was not suffering? You think he didn't suffer? They will just go scripture wrongly to you. He went to Egypt. When Isaac, now look at it. Isaac inherited all the wealth of Abraham. All his wealth. That wealth that you think is much. Isaac inherited it. One single famine in one year. All the wealth of Abraham was gone. And Isaac also was heading to Egypt. God now told Isaac. He said, stay in this land and plant there for I will bless you. I thought he had inherited the blessing of Abraham. <laughs> I thought all the sheep, all the goats, they were his own. It's because we do not rightly divide the word of truth. They are just deceiving you. Even Jacob. With all the things that Jacob said he had. He, he got to a point, he said, God bless me or else I will not let you go. As at that time, the Bible said he was rich in camels, he was rich in donkey, he was rich in goat and so on. So what blessing was Jacob asking for? If Jacob, who had all this material wealth, was still saying, Lord, bless me or else I will not let you go. Do you know what Jacob was asking for? It's what God has freely given to us believers. He said, for he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That was what David, Jacob was praying for. That's what you and I have free of charge. We carry Jesus on the inside. That is the wealth that we carry. Whether we have money or we, have, we don't have money, it doesn't matter. And it does not define our life. We are not living for money. No matter how much you have, you will die. No matter how poor you are, you will die. What will matter in the end is your relationship with Jesus. What God will ask of you, what did you do with Jesus? You are running to programs, not because you saw the miracle, but because you want bread. You're looking for somebody to prosper you. You are in deception. You are in error. He says, seek ye first the kingdom. Now, you cannot seek a kingdom which you are not part of. So except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the first step is that you become born again. And 1 John 3, 9 says, he that is born of God does not sin. So this born again that you continue to fornicate is not in the Bible. This born again that you continue to do adultery, you lie, you abuse, nothing has changed about your life. Nothing. You are as worldly as you were before you said you became born again. It's self-deception. No man is born again and is not truly born. You know the meaning of that word, born again. He said, if a man is in Christ, he's a new creature. He said, behold, all things have passed away and all things have become new. When you become born again, all things become new. I therefore want to invite you to surrender your life to Jesus. You may never have heard the gospel correctly, but I'm saying to you today, you can become born again. When they say you are saved, you have to be saved from something. You cannot continue in sin and be saying, I'm saved. Then why are you, what are you saved from? If somebody is kidnapped by kidnappers and you pay ransom and the person is still being held by the kidnapper, is the person saved? The Bible says you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. If the Jesus you know does not save you from sin, it's a fake Jesus that you know. Anybody that genuinely comes to Jesus and encounter him, they are delivered from sin. The Bible says he hated iniquity in his heart and he loved righteousness. They are not a people that, are, that wish they have opportunity to sin. Some of you are born again. You are still secretly cherishing sin in your heart. You wish you could fornicate. You wish you could commit adultery. You wish you could enjoy worldly music. It's because you have not been delivered in heart. He says a new heart will I give you and I will remove the heart of stone. I invite you today to repent and come to Jesus. I say, Lord Jesus, I want to truly know you today. I want to experience you today. I want you to deliver me from sin. 
from wrong doctrines, from lies, from this God of mammon. And I want you to come and become the Lord of my heart. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. I want you to be the only person that matters in my life. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, save me. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior today. Deliver me from sin. Deliver me from the sinful nature. Deliver me from worldliness. Fill me with your Holy Ghost and make me a child of God. Thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. My name once again is Olusia Gumoku Olu. If you have prayed that prayer, you are free to contact me. My contact details are on this page. And if you are watching this on the YouTube channel, just check the description below. You will find my email address and my phone number. Please feel free. No protocol around my life. You are free to contact me anytime. We also want to plead with you. Please share this message. That may be your own part in the kingdom. Just sharing this message. God bless you.